Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Widespread newspaper reports suggest that the army is considering a review of what it calls British era customs and practices with a view to ending them. So today we ask, is this a wise and necessary decision or is it a mistake that could have an adverse impact on the ethos and cohesion of the Indian army? Joining me to discuss that issue is the former Deputy Chief of the Indian Army, General Zamiruddin Shah. General Shah, there are widespread reports that have appeared in practically every newspaper that the Army is planning a review of what is called British era colonial customs with a view to ending them. The list includes the character of regiments, uniforms, pre-independence battle honours and even the grant of honorary commissions. Now, I'll come to details a little later, but let me start with a couple of general questions. First, in your opinion, is this a good idea or could such a review that ends these customs end up having an adverse impact on the ethos and cohesion of the Indian Army? If these measures are instituted, Mr. Karan, I think it will have a detrimental effect on the Army. I am very, very certain of it. There's a well-known maxim, anything that works and in this case works well, don't try and fix it. So we are trying to fix a system which has been working very, very well. I would like to say that militaries need to constantly evolve, institute changes according to the situation, but only, and I repeat only, after due deliberation by experienced stakeholders based on their wisdom, and long-term experience. Now, these changes which you are saying are very, very radical. And if they, are be, if they are to be foisted on the armed forces without an in-depth analysis, it would have a very, very adverse impact on the battle readiness and performance of the army. Now, veterans, no, let me just uh, uh, say, veterans are a sounding board and they must be contacted and their opinions taken before any measures are taken. And there are projected fit pitfalls which we can cover later. Now, the Indian Army, and you know this better than I do, has traditions and practices that go back literally centuries. The Madras Regiment was founded in 1758, the Rajputana Rifles in 1775, the Rajput Regiment in 1778, the Dogras in 1877. So let me ask you, how important are these traditions and customs to the ethos and the cohesion of the Indian Army? I think traditions are very, very important. They are the winding glue. The customs and traditions of a regiment are the glue that bind all personnel serving as well as retired into one cohesive mass of armed people. I think they are vital to, for their retention and they must be retained. Let's then at this point, General Zamiruddin Shah, come to specific details as 
printed by the newspapers. And I should add that there is a document circulating very widely. It's a two page document which purportedly comes from the Adjutant General's office where the details of what could be reviewed are actually itemized one by one. Now, one of the items that apparently is likely to be reviewed is the caste and ethnically specific character of regiments like the Sikh, the Gorkha, the Mahar, the Jat, and the Rajput. What impact would that have on these regiments? Uh, let me give a quote by T.S. Eliot. He says, tradition is how the vitality and past enriches the life of the present. Now, the past is something which all regimental soldiers are exceedingly proud. And I would say, in fact, I pointed out before the storm on the Agni Path uh, blew into our faces, that this would be extremely detrimental to the morale and ethos of the armed forces. And if you cut into that further, I think it would have a very negative impact on the armed forces. Now, what about that specific proposal to change the caste and ethnically specific character of regiments like the Sikhs, the Gorkha, the Mahar, the Jat, the Rajput? What will that do to these regiments? Because they exist around that character. If you now try and amend it, what will happen to the regiment? No, I, I, I entirely agree. See, the regimental system, I served in a, in, in a regiment which consists of Rajputs, total, uh, all three batteries. I knew their traditions, I knew their customs, I knew them better than their mothers. I served there 20 years and I knew them backwards, in and out. And let me tell you that I have seen very, very successful mixed units too. It's not that mixed units have a major disadvantage, but there are a few things which have to be taken in mind. One is the regimental traditions, which is going to be the deity in the place of worship. Uh, if there are three or four different things, then there will have to be three or four deities. What about the war cry? What about the regimental song? What about the method of dress? What about the dietary habits? These are differ from place to place all over the country. So I think that uh, the one class units are just as strong as the multicast, but they have a large number of advantages which should not be overlooked. So you're saying that if the ethnically specific and caste specific character of regiments is changed, then the war cry, the regimental song, the method of dress will all come into question and all have to change. And that would be detrimental to the very regiment's morale and ethos. Absolutely. And uh, don't overlook the dietary habits of men. I mean, the, the dietary habits of people in the north are totally different from the dietary habits of the person in the south. These must not be forgotten. These should be uh, kept in mind before instituting any change. Now, it's also reported that the army is proposing to review and perhaps do away with pre-independence battle honors. This, I accept, is a somewhat tricky subject. But my question is a simple one. Is this a good idea? Because these battle honours were conferred or earned when Indian soldiers under the command of British officers were fighting other Indian armies or other Indian kingdoms. Or is it a bad idea to do away with battle honours? Because at the end of the day, these honours valorise the heroism of soldiers, which is something the regiments are very proud of. And therefore, if you do away with these honours, you will be affecting something that the regiment takes great pride in. Which of the two? Well, uh... To a large extent, the battle honours uh, signify the valour of individual soldiers on how well they fought in various battles. But it is my personal opinion that uh, battle honours won by units during operations with other Indian states or Indian armies and other things now can be dispensed with. There is enough scope for the units to win battle honours. They are vital, as I said, but I think my personal opinion is that battle honours which relate to past glories against fellow Indians can be dropped.
Okay, that's very clear. Let me come to a third area where once again it is proposed to make fairly drastic dramatic changes after the review. I'm talking about military uniforms. One in particular that is set to be on the chopping block is the dashing blue patrols, the ceremonial winter uniform. It's also said that lanyards could be revised and done away with. Now, in your eyes, would this be an acceptable change that leads to modernization or would it be a mistake because you're doing away with something that soldiers are very fond of? Uh, let me tell you, Karen, my personal uh, example. I mean, I joined, decided to join the National Defense Academy when I was in class 10 because I used to see these officers of the Grenadiers uh, Center in from Nasirabad uh, coming to meet my father, who was posted in Ajmer in their ceremonial dress. And I was very, very impressed. And I think dress maketh a man. The dresses are a vital element of motivating people into the to join the armed forces. The dress is a matter of pride. You know, stand soldiers must stand out from the others. That is why the army lays a lot of stress on accoutrement and dress. And I would say that the smartest dress uh, of the officers is the blue patrol. And there's no requirement at all to dispense with it. Yes, lanyards were worn by units which had animals and a whistle was attached to the lanyard. But I think they add color to a uniform and I think there's no harm done in uh, dispensing with oglets or the lanyard for that matter. But the blue patrols, you say, should be retained. Absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, I am very, very proud of the fact that I wore a blue patrol. In fact, I presented it to my regiment and they've hung it in the museum. It is something which we are all very, very, very proud of. And it would be very, very short-sighted to do away with a dress which is uh, well uh, worn by soldiers and which is... Uh, well, uh, uh, seen in a very good light, which is uh, seen by civilians, it motivates them to join. I think there's no need to dispense with it. Now, bizarrely, General Shah, there are also reports that the army is going to review and do away with honorary commissions, which are given to junior commissioned officers. What in the world has the government got against honorary commissions? That's a way of promoting a JCO to an officer rank. Why, that, why should that be considered British or colonial? Absolutely. You know, my grandfather served in the First World War in 37 Lancers Baluch, and he was made an honorary lieutenant. Now, this is something the family was all very, very proud of. Of course, at that time, there was no major enhancement of pay. But now, a soldier who has retired, who has given his life for the armed forces, who's retired after 30 or 35 years service, if he gets better pension when he is granted an honorary commission, what is the problem? Is it because of uh, financial, cons uh, financial constraints? Well, I think there are other better ways of saving money. But please do not try and save a little bit. And, you know, uh, the, the rewards which a soldier deserves after so many years by withdrawing them. Let me at this point, General Shah, raise three further issues with you because they are hinted at. We don't know for sure what will be the outcome, but I would like to have your opinion nonetheless. First, if the army is reviewing British era colonial customs and practices, are you worried it might also do away with the Chetwood Oath, which is a critical part of the passing out tradition at the Indian Military Academy. Would it be a mistake to do away with it? No, I think the Chetwood Oath, we all remember it, we all honor it, and it is something, uh, in fact, if you read my book, uh, The Sarkari Musalman, the first thing is which I've done on the first page is quoting the Chetwood, what we learned in Chetwood. This by no means should be abandoned. It is a, a great lesson for the, for the future officers, the honor, welfare and country of your honor and welfare of your country comes first, always and every time. 
This is something which soldiers cannot forget and should not be given up. Let me, for the sake of the audience who may not be familiar with the Chetwood Oath, actually read it out for them. The safety, honor, and welfare of your country come first, always, and every time. The honor, welfare, and comfort of the men you command come next. Your own ease, comfort, and safety come last, always, and every time. Now, this oath is the work of a former British Field Marshal, Field Marshal Chetwood. Because the authorship is British, is that a good reason for doing away with it? Or does it touch at the very core of the sentiments that every army, including the Indian army, observes and therefore should be retained, regardless of who the author is? I agree. It touches the very core. And I would say it should be retained by all means and never given up. Now, it's also said that the army is considering ending the affiliation with what's called the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Which, keep, which pays for the upkeep of cemeteries like the one in Kohima, where soldiers from all over the world, but including, and this is important, including Indian soldiers, are laid to rest. Would it be okay to end this affiliation because most of the soldiers perhaps are non-Indian, or would it be disregarding and disrespect to the Indian soldiers laid to rest there who gave up their lives fighting during the Second World War? Which of the two? The army respects fallen soldiers, whether of own or of the enemy. You have seen the, the honorable way in which soldiers from Pakistan and Kargil were buried with full military honors. I have been posted in Nagaland and I took a large number of my rel relatives to the, uh, to the cemetery at Kohima. And it says, when you go home, tell them of us who fell at Kohima. Now, can there be more moving words? I think it would be a very, very retrograde and negative idea to give up the affiliation with the War Graves Commission. Fallen soldiers, let them be own or their adversary. Their places of burial or cremation need to be kept in mind, need to be honored and retained. In fact, the epitaph at Kohima is one of the most moving anywhere in the world. I'm paraphrasing it because I don't remember it identically. But it says, when you go home, tell them of us. We gave our today for your tomorrow. It is actually so moving that when you say it, it almost brings tears to one's voice. Not eyes, but one's voice. Now, finally, General Zamiruddin Shah, there are reports that they, that they may do away with beating retreat. There's absolutely no doubt that beating retreat is a British custom, but surely after 75 years, it's as Indian as parliamentary democracy. Our parliamentary democracy is entirely modeled on the functioning of the House of Commons in Britain, and no one's proposing any changes in that. Even the voting in parliament is in terms of I and nay, which are British terminology, not Indian. Now, if parliamentary democracy can be retained, why not beating retreat? Or do you think the time has come for beating retreat to be done away with? Oh, Karan, I understand that music is the barometer of a soldier's soul. Absolutely, it is vital for the morale and for the upkeep of the soldiers, you know, their, their fighting spirits. I mean, after all, in Britain, the bagpipers uh, sometimes lead. Uh, this uh, legacy of beating the retreat, you can also count it as legacy of the withdrawal of the British from India. I mean, that's uh, that what, what it can signify. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, an age-old custom, which has been so appreciated all over the world, which sways the Indian masses whenever they witness beating the retreat, must be retained at all costs. Now, I presume that all of this, if it happens, would be part of the Modi government's determination to do away with colonialism and slavery. As you will recall, that was a very important major part of the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech this year. But in this specific case, should the army chief and top generals of the army high command have resisted rather than give the appearance that they're agreeing and giving in? Well, I personally believe that the only master you should serve 
is your conscience. And I have been repeating to my command is that we are subordinate, but not subservient to political authority. We are not subservient. And that is the very, for a very good reason, the president of India has been made the supreme commander. It is for this very reason. And I would say that I'm sure that the senior officers of the army, including the chief, would take into consideration all that matters for Indian soldiers. I'd like to tell you a few other aspects, Karan. One is, you know, after the Second World War, the Japanese army, because of the push to disarm the Japanese, their, their uniforms were very purposely, very, very shoddy. This was detrimental to the morale of the armed forces. The old military, Japanese military ethos was done away with. I am glad that there has been a resurgence of that in Japan. Also, I would like to give you the example of the American army. In 1951, they decided to do away with the regimental system. What happened to the American army in Vietnam and in Afghanistan? And now I am told, although the, the regiments are numbered, I mean, after all, there's a lot in a name and very little in a number. My regiment is 170 medium regiment. It's a number, but we call it the Veer Rajputs. It is known right across the army. So there's a lot in a name and very little in a number. So we must learn from the lessons of history. And I would, uh, uh, would stress, and I'm very, very certain that the present hierarchy in the army would keep all this in mind and not be bulldozed by bureaucrats who have never been under fire, who've never seen a war and who are armchair strategists. So what you're saying, in effect, is that the army chief and the top generals should not let themselves be bulldozed. They should stand up for traditions that are vital to the ethos and culture of the army. And they should ensure, because you took the American example, that regiments are not played around with. And they should also ensure, because you took the Japanese example, that uniforms and smartness of uniforms is retained. That's what you're saying, aren't you? Absolutely. If you've got to learn from history, you've got to learn what happened to armies which gave up old traditions, old uniforms. Of course, you know, you've got to innovate, you've got to move forward. But the good things in life don't give up. Finally, there is a review plan. What the outcome of the review will be, we don't know, but the review is planned. And I want to end by asking you this. At a time when the army has very many important tasks to tackle, like Agnipat recruitment, like modernization of weapons, is this review a priority? Is this the right time to be doing this review? Or should they say, look, there are other more important things that must take precedence? Mr. Thapa, they are very, very pressing issues. One is, the principal one is modernization, the adversaries knocking on our borders. This is not the time to attend to peripheral issues. You may think they are peripheral, but they are vital and important for the morale, well-being and the tightly-knit family of the army. General Shah, thank you very much for expressing your views so clearly and so bluntly. Take care. Stay safe. Jai Hind, uh, Mr. Karan, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? 
All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.